And joining us now in studio, Duncan Hawthorne. He's president and CEO of Bruce Power, and we welcome you back to these studios. I don't mind saying I wish it were on a happier occasion. This is just one of the most horrendous things any of us has ever seen, and I presume the nuclear business being what it is, you know some of the folks over there, eh? Yeah, it's, uh, it's really quite a tight-knit family, the nuclear group, and obviously I, I serve on the board of WANO, which is the kind of world uh, organizing body, so I come across a lot of the Japanese CEOs and many of the operators through that. Have so, you been yes. in touch with any of them? Yeah, actually, very regular contact. It's, as I say, it's a small family, so they want us to know what's going on. We want them to know that we're there to help. So, yeah, there's pretty ready dialogue between us. Okay, let's put a map up that uh, our director, if I could ask Michael Smith to bring this up. I suspect many of us have seen this already over the last couple of days, but we'll just confirm. There, off the coast of Sendai, that's where the epicenter of the quake was, 8.9 magnitude. And we have listed there two of the locations where there are nuclear installations in the country, the two black dots. That's not every nuclear plant in the country, of course, but those are the two that have been most dramatically affected by the earthquakes. And I guess we should also just, Duncan, off the top, establish that the stations that you run here in the province of Ontario are built, I presume, by ACL, Atomic yes. Energy of Canada. These ones aren't, so they're not exactly the same, but obviously you have a good understanding of how their systems work, and that's why we've got you in here today. The operating reactors at both power stations automatically shut down during the earthquake, we've been told. Yet even after the shutdown, there is still a crisis. How come? Well, the reality is that everything that you would want to see happen, happened for the first hour, Steve. You know, it was uh, the plant shut down automatically, either because of the seismic detection equipment that, which they all have, or because they were electrically disconnected from the system because of earthquake damage. Uh, and uh, uh, the most immediate thing once a reactor comes offline is cooling the reactor. Uh, that happens by backup supplies, and here too that worked as well. Uh, and it worked for the first hour. Uh, and then they were hit with a tsunami. Uh, tsunami was really what did the damage to the backup cooling, not the earthquake. Tsunami, uh, they have diesel generators. Um, the tsunami came along, washed away the diesel tanks. Uh, and killed their backup supply, which was supplying the cooling. So that was when the trouble really started. Uh, and of course, really, since then, all they've been doing is trying to cope with the loss of their normal cooling operation. Uh, they've, they've, they needed to vent off pressure, which you saw the effect of that in pretty dramatic fashion when the, when the secondary containment exploded. Uh, but throughout, they've been trying to recover cooling, uh, cope with that. Uh, and ultimately decided that seawater was the only option they had. I'm going to follow up on that with the seawater in a second, but before we get there, two buildings that house reactors, I gather, at the Fukushima Daiichi plant have since exploded. Do we know what caused the explosions? Yeah, yeah, we know exactly what caused that. The reality is that the, the primary containment is where the fuel is. Uh, there's a secondary containment, which they can vent into. If there's an overpressure situation, they can vent uh, that overpressure into the secondary containment. One of the problems they have is that because they uncovered some fuel, uh, you start seeing the presence of hydrogen. Again, not normally a problem. Secondary containment, there's an expectation that hydrogen could be there, and you have devices that scavenge for hydrogen and, and burn it off before it forms a combustible mix. But those devices are powered by electricity, and they lost the power to those. So without that effective means, they start building up hydrogen. They're venting more often, and so there's more hydrogen. Hydrogen is lighter than air, so it, it collects at the top of the building. Uh, you get some you know, combustion, and you, you see the effect. It's flammable. There are concerns that the damaged reactors are in partial meltdown. What happens to a reactor when it's not partial meltdown, but full-fledged? Yeah, well, again, the, the term meltdown is very kind of emotive. If I give you an example, at Three Mile Island, half of the fuel melted, uh, a molten mi mix of fuel, uh, you know, so 50% of the fuel melted, but there never was an off-site release, there never was a radiation uh, outside containment because the containment did its job. Um, obviously that's what people are expecting here too, that the containment will do its job, and so far it has. So there has been fuel damage in all three units. Uh, started in Unit 1, it then uh, became an issue in Unit 3, and more recently in Unit 2, but they all have fuel damage. Uh, so the important thing now is to limit that by uh, applying cooling. You know, n none of these plants will ever run again. It's more about making sure that the containment doesn't suffer any damage. But my hunch is there's a sense, uh, maybe in our viewers, that um, you know, a, a meltdown is something you see at a, store, uh, at a Star Trek, you know, core reactor meltdown, huge explosion. Yep. That doesn't happen, does it? 
No, I mean, the reality is that in a very worst case situation where you have no water in the core, you have the fuel continuing to melt, you know, bad things happen. But, you know, they, they, and there's a lot of conjecture about how bad it can get. But, you know, an important thing really is when you consider Three Mile Island or indeed Chernobyl, faults originated in the plant, problems in the plant uh, that compounded themselves in the plant. Here it was an external event that affected two, three pretty normal plants and the... Uh, and so all the systems were available when you went into the accident. And, and the truth is, when you look at the ferocity of the earthquake, the plant was untouched by it. So the seismic qualification did exactly what it was supposed to do. It kept all the structures intact. I mean, there's been some pretty alarming footage here of the damage done, but no one's really commented on the fact that the nuclear plant looks untouched. Uh, until the explosion, which was uh, you know, a different issue, this, the earthquake did nothing to the structure. So Which is what it's designed to do. It did its job in the first case. Yeah, and now what we need to do is, is see the primary containment do what it's designed to do, which is control and contain. Um, well, you told us a, a, just a few minutes ago that they've decided to pump seawater into the reactor in order to try to cool it down. What do you think of that decision? Well, you know, the, the reality is it's, a, it's an obvious heat sink they have sitting right there. They've got the Pacific Ocean. Have you got something else and you're looking around for a source of cool water? Uh, your, your reactor's already uh, beyond economic use because of the fuel melt, so it's a very readily available source of, uh, of water, so, you know, why not? But has uh, that been done before? Yeah, it's not unusual, you know, the, the reality of these is plants sit on the Pacific Ocean, it's salt water, you know, when you look at our plants here, we are using lakes, fresh water, different situation, but, uh, so it's not unusual to have salt water. And a lot of island, all of the UK plants are on uh, because of its island nature, they're all seawater cooled. And, um, and if we needed to, that's exactly what our shutdown plans would have required. And how long would that take to, to work? Well, it, water's water. The, the, the difference between seawater and, and you know, real water is only about the unhelpful characteristics of seawater, which is salt and other things, which mm. if you wanted to use the plant again, that would be bad, really bad news. But if you're looking for the ability to cool is not a problem. Is there anything else you would recommend that they do to bring this situation under more control? You know what, the, the reality is that Japan has got 54 reactors. It's a very mature operating environment. They've had nuclear power a long time. They're what, good the operators. 30% of their mix or something? Yeah, and they're good operators. You know, so uh, these boiling water reactors, we have six of them in the US. Uh, actually, when I came to the US, one of the first plants we bought was actually a plant identical to this. So I know the plant pretty well. But they're good operators. They're, uh, they're really, they're faced with a lot of changing circumstances, Steve. So, you know, they're trying to juggle a lot of things. And so the important thing to note is if this was just one reactor, that would be a challenge. But to have three side by side, all with the same issue, uh, they just have to you know, prioritize things. And job one is keep the reactor cool. So what are you watching for now? As you well, it's exactly that. Thing? You know, I, I, you know, I look at people issues. The truth of it is I'm an operator. I know what it must feel like to be in that control room. These people have not been relieved. They don't know where their family is. Mm -hmm. Some of their colleagues were washed away by the tsunami. Uh, you know, this, they've seen two explosions. They're in a central control room, uh, and they're coping with that. It's a, you know, it's a tough personal issue. The problem is, we're at the stage where the installed equipment isn't doing everything it needs, so you're relying on people. And you've got to remember that, that people have a limit. So it's important they get relieved now. It's important they get support now. And that's why the kind of Wano family is offering, if, if best we can offer is moral support, it's still worth having. So <clears throat> given all of the personal difficulties they're undergoing, given that the water that they're putting in to try to cool things down is not, as you would say, perfect, because it's got salt water and other, salt in it and other problems, uh, do you have a sense about how long it will take to get these reactors cooled? Well, they've actually started to make good progress over the last 40 years. As I say, you know, if you ask me on Saturday, we were very concerned about Unit 1. Unit 1's now flooded with seawater, temperatures down, you know, you can see the benefit. Unit 3, uh, you know, yesterday we'd have been worried about it, and it's somewhat better. Today we're worried about Unit 2, they're worried about having a hydrogen explosion there because the characteristics are the same, they've uncovered the fuel, and now they're pumping seawater in there. So I'll feel comfortable when I see them all full of seawater. The problem is some of their indications aren't working, so they're not sure just exactly how much water's there. Given how unprecedented all of this is, for them to be sure, are they in full panic mode right now? No, I, I mean, the, 
part of this is about culture too. You know, I think the Japanese culture is actually helping you know greatly. They're very calm natured people. You know, we often when we work with them, we we have to be very cognizant of the different culture. But that that culture is kind of perfect for the environment they're in. They're not people that are prone to panic. They're very even tempered people, and they, they will do uh, their job in a pretty calm demeanor. The reactors, as we pointed out off the top, are built by General Electric. Yours are yes. built by Atomic Energy of Canada. So they're different, but are they similar? There's not really a lot of similarities, to be honest. A, a boiling water reactor is, uh, as the name implies, it's a reactor in which, the, under normal operation, the water boils. We don't have anything like that. You know, I, I try and explain it to people and have by saying, we have a small amount of fuel sur surrounded by a large amount of water. Mm -hmm. Boiling water reactors have a lot of fuel surrounded by a little bit of water. Uh, so there's, the characteristics under this scenario are very different. But could our reactors withstand what their reactors have been asked to withstand? Well, we, we've, to a certain degree, we've kind of tested our reactors. If you remember the blackout in 2003, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was actually here with you when we talked about it. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 that was the plant being entirely separated from the rest of the world and having to support itself. Our backup systems had to cut in and supply everything we needed, and it was really a kind of non-event with respect to the nuclear plants. They did their job, and, and you know it was kind of taken for granted they would. But but all of those systems were tested live time, and and you know found to do their job. Well, here's the bigger overarching question now. This, of course, this incident has put back in people's minds any fears or concerns they had about nuclear power that I think the industry had actually gone some measure to lay certainly after Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, uh, nukes were making a bit of a comeback. Yeah. Are, are, you know, how big a setback is this? Well, you know, there's no doubt it's in people's mind. I've I done a few interviews today and someone reminded me that two days from now is the anniversary of Three Mile Island. You know, I hadn't, yeah, it wasn't even in my mind that it was. Uh, and it's not so far away now that we'll uh, see the 25th anniversary of Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, this will, this will go into the same conversation as, as those two. And, and you're right, there, there was a, a, you know, a feeling that the nuclear industry had earned a reputation for reliable, you know, reliable, safe operation. And 25 years since Chernobyl, we've, we can stand a bit taller. But relatives, we've got to put this in perspective. You know, it's a, it's a tremendous test for a nuclear plant, what we've just seen. And this plant stood, stood that test. Uh, and, you know, I, I think it would be wrong to overreact to this. It's, it's not wrong to, to look at the lessons we can learn from it, but it's wrong to overreact and say, well, that's all of the good stuff that the industry's done counts for naught. Uh, I appreciate that, but, but th this is not like, um, you know, this is not like Niagara Falls shutting off or it's not like a coal fire plant, you know, not working. Nu yep. Nuclear is different. You'd acknowledge that. Absolutely. Yeah. And therefore, um, you know, people are going to be more nervous about this. You've got radiation going into the into the air. You've got, you know, you can't see it. People have no idea whether or not they've been affected, uh, how much impact on their on their lives this is going to be. You can appreciate all that. Yeah, and so. that's uh, that's been the problem with nuclear power all along, Steve. It's hard to have a thirty second conversation about what we do. You have to talk about splitting atoms, and it's a tough story to tell. So these kind of events, you know, they live long in the memory. So I I, I think that is a challenge for us, and we have to reassure people. Is there anything, has there been anything associated with this incident in Japan that you think has been wildly exaggerated and the public has not got the facts right on? Well, I think there's probably two things. Firstly, there's the, the, the meltdown language, which suggests, you know, all is lost. And secondly, there's reports of radiation sickness and things like that, which are grossly exaggerated. You know, uh, that, the kind of levels of radiation you would need to have those kind of events would require the primary containment to be breached, which it hasn't. So, you know, a couple of those things, I think, have been, um, you know, misreported. And a couple of the possible doomsday scenarios have had a lot of airtime. You know, the, the reality is, more than 10,000 people here have lost their life, and we're, you know, we're talking more about what might happen and less about what has no, happened. I understand. And I think the, the, I mean, the last reports I saw said three people got too much exposure to radiation, which when you consider 10,000 dead, yeah. you know, it, it does put things into perspective. Is there any nuclear facility anywhere in the world that you're aware of that could have withstood the double natural disaster, earthquake and tsunami, that these plants have been asked to endure? Well, that's a tough question to ask because the, it's a lot to do with the siting of the plant. Obviously, you know, these plants are, are on an island uh, environment. There are plants in, 
you know, the west coast of the US, wh which are rated for lesser uh, seismic events. So if they saw an event of this magnitude, that might be a challenge for them, but they, they are not designed to withstand that. Our plants are seismically qualified, but not to this level because we don't live in the same active environment. So is, there's no simple answer to that. A plant is designed and then it's sited and you have to be, bo meet both requirements separately. How good is the site? and what type of plant do you intend to put on it. Gotcha. Duncan Hawthorne, it's good of you to come in tonight and help us answer these questions about uh, an awful incident that's taken place in Japan. Thanks so much. You're welcome.